So in this lecture, we will quite qualitatively discuss how we can estimate or calculate the carrier densities associated with doped semiconductors. So we will give, not derive, equations that can be used especially at very cold temperatures. So that would be in at cryogenic temperatures and discuss the, the kind of general, although quite uncommonly used case where a semiconductor is being doped both with donors and by with acceptors. And, and we will end this lecture by discussing the general temperature dependence of carrier densities inside semiconductors. And we will we will find out that the like in a way we could say that there are three different regimes for the semiconductor in terms of their, their conductivities. So this is what we will be doing in this lecture. So let's get started. What we will do here is that we will begin by qualitatively just discussing what are the carrier densities that are present in a doped semiconductor. And first, we just consider a conduction electron concentration N. So we are considering what happens when we are doping the semiconductor with N-type uh, dopants. And here we are only for simplicity considering cryogenic temperatures. So in essence, this means that the KPT value is far smaller than the ionization energy. And we, we consider the case that we only to dope with n-type doping, so we don't have any acceptors present in the semiconductor. And, and this really simplifies the expression we, would, we could derive to calculate the carrier concentration densities at the conduction band. So the n will be then the square root of n0 uh, times nd. nd is the donor concentration. n0, uh, I will give the parameter shortly. And, and this inside the square root, and then you have the exponential dependence that depends on now on the minus ED ionization energy associated with the donor state per two times KPT value. So N0 is uh, related to temp temperature, and, and this is essentially what we already had for the case of intrinsic carrier concentration. So N0 will be equal to two times Me, the effective mass of our electron at the conduction band times KPT value divided by two. 2 pi h bar squared and this to the power of 3 over 2. And this uh, nd capital N is our donor concentration. So this is quite simple equation and what we see is that they, by changing the, this donor concentration we can quite easily change adjust the, the carrier concentration. So essentially the number of electrons at the conduction band. And similar equation holds for acceptors. So essentially, in that case, we would assume that we would not have any donors present. And why we are mainly interested in these scenarios is that usually it's not beneficial to dope a semiconductor with both types of dopants. So better is usually to just focus on doping either with n-type doped and uh, n-type doping or by p-type doping. So usually we only add, want to add electrons into the conduction band or we want to add holes into the valence band, but we, we, we don't try to do both because that will end up in a kind of like a, these, these two effects or processes competing against each other and the conductivities would not rise, but rather we would start having scattering effects due to increased amount of impurities in our semiconductor. Of course, the general case could be treated. So the semiconductor could be doped with both donors and acceptors, but that case would be a little bit complicated. And of course, if one would need to solve that kind of scenario, in practice, one would need to do it numerically. And how it could be done is that the, we should also take use of the mass action law. And essentially, the kind of product of n times p, that, they, that should be a constant. So that could be used, and, and numerically, the scenario could be solved. But for our case, for our purposes, we are not much interested in that kind of most general case scenario. Increase of donors, of course, what happens is that they will subsequently increase the concentration of electrons in at the conduction band. 
And if we would uh, add uh, acceptors into the mix, we would increase the whole concentration. Uh, sorry. And, and in this case, when we are increasing the electron concentration n, like uh, the whole concentration p is is decreased. So this is this is what will happen in the in the general case. So sum of carrier concentrations, so n plus p increases. So of course, like in the general case, the conductivity will be increasing, providing that we assume that we have equal mobilities, which is in fact not really the case in terms of semiconductors because the, the curvatures of the conduction bands and the valence bands are not equal, they are not identical. So subsequently the effective masses will be different for electrons and holes and thus their mobilities will be different. But nevertheless, like we could increase the carrier concentrations. But this is not the best way to maximize the conductivity. So it's it's much better to just dope either with n-type doping or by p-type doping, but not really with both. So this is something that you, you should kind of think yourself and, and agree that the, this, this in the end makes sense. So mass action law applies. We can increase n plus p, but the, if n times p equals constant, then we are in, in trouble. So because of this, essentially when we are doping semiconductors, either we, we dope with a n-type or by p-type doping, and then this means that either we will have electrons or we will have holes in grade excess. So this is in essence what we want to achieve when we are doping semiconductors. And then, of course, this means that uh, we could start using terminology to kind of explain what happens. So we can take the, the carriers that are more abundant in our semiconductor, and we could call them majority carriers. And then the, the, the carriers that are not that abundant, we could call them minority carriers. So as an example, if you have an N-doped semiconductor, in this case, the electrons will be majority carriers and then the, the holes will be minority carriers, and the vice versa. So if we have p-type doped semiconductor, then in, in such a material, holes are majority carriers, and electrons in the conduction band, they will be the minority carriers. And now, w when we are considering the kind of concentrations of electrons and holes, uh, and a kind of like a, a what gives rise to this mass action law. Well, it, of course, these kind of uh, electrons being raised into higher energy levels, it, it's basically purely statistics and, and driven by the thermal energies that we have in the system. And I recalling equipartition theorem, we kind of know that it's kind of like complicated dynamic mixture of electrons being being excited. Uh, due to the presence of thermal energy in the higher states, and then on the other hand, like higher energy states being relaxed into lower energy states due to statistics of the system. And and what gives rise to this kind of uh, uh, dynamics or, or sto the stochastic nature for the process is that they, of course we will have carrier recombination as a process. So a single conduction electron can annihilate a whole state. And, and this is what can happen, or, or you know, one way of thinking is that the a kind of electron in the valence band can also be raised, and then it will be creating a hole subsequently into the valence band. And although this is not conceptually very hard to understand what happens, so essentially electrons will be just raised to a higher energy level, or a electron and a hole will be annihilated if, if such case is possible. So in essence, an electron will be, be moving down into a vacancy state and that minimizes the total energy of the system. So the, the processes are quite simple to understand, but what makes things complicated that is that, of course, we have many, many, many electrons involved in, in our system. So... Basically, it's a kind of a statistical system or a dynamic system that we should consider. And then when we would want to quantitatively understand what happens, then our treatment would be more involved than what we want to do here. 
and then they kind of are happy in mean, just saying that this is beyond our scope. So in essence, please remember in a, already in a few one cubic centimeter of a piece of a solid, we have electrons to the order of like a Avogadro's number, so 10 to the power of 30, uh, sorry, 23. So uh, we have a lot of electrons in essence that, that we should consider. And, and all these, these kind of like a excitation of electrons in the higher state and, and on the other hand carrier recombination, so electron uh, relaxing back to a lower energy state, they are statistical processes and we should actually calculate the statistics that are associated with these possibilities and then, then we should kind of estimate what happens. But, but this is something we, we do not want to consider here on this course. So instead, what we will do is that we will only qualitatively discuss what happens in terms of the temperature uh, for the carrier densities associated with semiconductors. So we want you to understand how these, these populations get changed uh, when we change the temperature of our system. And at this point, I would also like to remind you that please remember that the temperature dependencies that we have for the electrical conductivities for metals, and when we are like uh, considering the temperature dependencies of semiconductors, these are fundamentally different. So like physically, if you would measure a electrical conductivity of a metal at a given temperature, and if you would increase the temperature, the electrical conductivity would be decreased. So in essence, there will be the a more electron-electron scattering, and that decreases the, the uh, kind of uh, mobility of conduction electrons in a metal. And in a semiconductor, when we are increasing the temperature, we are most of the time, in fact, quite dramatically raising the concentration of electrons at the conduction band. Or in the case of uh, P-type doped semiconductors, we are increasing the concentration of holes in the valence band, and, and this process really increases the conductivity more dramatically than the increased temperature decreases the mobilities. So the same thing also happens, of course, for semiconductors, so that the mobilities of carriers will be decreased due to the fact that we, we are increasing possibilities, for example, for electron-electron scattering. But this process and its temperature dependence is much more weaker than, than the, the temperature dependence that is being associated with the change of, of carrier concentrations. So there will be these two competing processes also in semiconductors, but the other process dominates and that gives rise to the different different temperature dependence of electrical conductivities for semiconductors than compared to the metals. So please remember this, this simple example. I think it's a very good example to kind of understand what's happening in different types of materials. And now finally, let's go into the kind of different regimes that can be found in terms of the electrical conductivities for a case of semiconductors. So when we are considering at very small temperatures, so we have this kind of so-called freeze-out region, and, and this really happens at temperatures T, where the temperature is, is far smaller than the ionization energy divided by Kp value, so like a quite, quite cryogenic temperatures. Then we will have the extrinsic regime, and, and this would be so-called intermediate temperatures, so the temperatures would be slightly larger than, than the ionization energy is divided by Kp value. And then we have finally the kind of intrinsic region. And this would correspond to quite high temperatures when in fact the temperature would be higher even than the band gap value divided by Kp. So this is the kind of three regimes that we can find. And most of the time when we are dealing with doped semiconductors, we, we want to operate at the extrinsic regime. So we do not need to, to kind of raise the temperature of the semiconductor anymore on this level so that the conductivities would be quite large. But if we would not be doping our semiconductor, we would be forced in essence to increase the temperature quite dramatically 
please note the difference here. We are considering ionization energies for the case of freeze out regime and extrinsic regime. And for the intrinsic case, we have the band gap energy value here. And this is usually like a electron volts, like a one, two electron volts. And ionization energies are, are some 20, 30, 40, 50 milli electron volts. So this picture hopefully hi highlights to you and, and clarify what happens. So at the low temperature regime, like uh, we are really at, at cryogenic temperatures. And even though we have, have these, these impurities, so that we have these, these uh, dopant, uh, so, sorry, donor states here, the, the temperature is so small that the, the, these, even these dopants cannot yet readily ionize and we, we don't really increase the number of electrons at the conduction band. And, and subsequently, if we would consider things through the chemical potential, the chemical potential would be residing cl quite close to the midway of the valence band here and the conduction band, because that's, that's where the most of the electrons are. So there's like not that much of electrons in the conduction band yet, and this is what would then dictate where the Fermi level would be. And then we have the intermediate case, so this so-called extrinsic regime. And now we have temperature that is already large enough to, to considerably excite, like thermally excite the donor states into the conduction band. So recall that the, the, the energies of the donor states with respect to the kind of smallest energy value of a conduction band this energy difference is of the order of, of some tens of milli electron volts. So then when we would be, for example, a, a, having operating at room temperature, then then the, the room temperature, 26 milli electron volts, would be a, roughly of the same order after the ionization energy. And then, then quite a bit of, of donor states, donor electrons already are being raised into the conduction band. But please note that not that much of, of valence band electrons will yet be excited. So they do not readily yet be excited into the conduction band. So this is not yet what happens. But only when we go into the intrinsic regime, so at very high temperatures, what happens is that they really most, if not all, donor states have, have been ionized. So and, and the electrons then are most of the time residing at the conduction band. And at this intrinsic regime, the temperature is also so high that the, quite a bit of these electrons residing at the valence band, they can be also thermally excited into the conduction band. So these are the three different regimes we can find for the semiconductors with respect to their kind of electrical conductivity with respect to temperature. And then please note also what happens for the Fermi level that they, that, that has been adjusted also accordingly in order to be the compatible with its definition. <clears throat> so what we can now do, let's recap what we have discovered, is that we can really understand qualitatively where the chemical potential mu will be as a function of temperature. So at the low temperatures, the chemical potential, like uh, essentially equal to the Fermi level here, is close to the midway of the band cap, so close to the value of Eg per 2. When we turn the temperature slightly up, at these intermediate temperatures, for example, at the room temperature, the chemical potential mu is being raised close to the ED value. So the ionization energy associated with the donor states. And then at the very high temperatures, the chemical potential is further raised above the ionization energy as is being shown in the C figure here. So this is how, how we can understand how things happen. And, and please, please take your time to grasp what happens in these three different temperature regimes, because I think it's it's useful thing to understand. And I think it helps to clarify what this doping actually does for semiconductors and how it changes the, the carrier concentrations. So I thank you for listening and, and please follow, follow with me uh, for the next lecture. Thanks and bye bye.